Welcome to 2024 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Welcome to lesson number two, titled Teach Us to Pray, ready for teaching on January 13. It's from the Sabbath School series Psalms, authored by Dr. Dragoslava Sandrak and read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, January 6. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Your word is so precious to us, and particularly here in this book of Psalms, which is right in the center of the Old Testament. Lord, we just thank you for what it brings to us, how it shows us how your people related to you and how you related to them in the past, but also how we can worship you and how we can praise you. We just thank you for what it brings to us. And we pray that this week your Holy Spirit will guide us as we open your word, that we may learn to pray. Lord, I'd like to pray today for Barbara Borges in Merced in California. And I pray that you'll bless her as she each week listens to these lessons. And to Debbie Lear and to Joan, uh, who requested... uh, help for her mother from Jamaica and Deborah and Lloyd Beckford and Lord wherever people are listening around the world I pray that our needs may be filled that our prayers may be answered and that your love may be shown to those around us Bless us now as we open your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Luke chapter 11 and verse 1. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Let's read that again, Luke 11 and verse 1. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. A belief that only spontaneous, unlearned prayer is real prayer appears to be prevalent among some Christians. However, Jesus' disciples were immensely rewarded when they asked Jesus to teach them to pray. God placed a prayer book, the Psalms, at the heart of the Bible, not simply to show us how God's people of ancient times prayed, but also to teach us how we can pray today. From the earliest ages, the Psalms have shaped the prayers of God's people, including Jesus' prayers, as we will read in the following verses. 1 Chronicles 16, verses 7. On that day, David first delivered this psalm into the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord. And verse 9, sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works. And Nehemiah 12, verse 8, moreover the Levites were Jeshua, Binua, Cadmiel, Sherebiah, Judah, and Mataniah, who led the thanksgiving psalms, he and his brethren. And Matthew 27, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me. And Ephesians 5 verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. This week, we will look at the role the psalms played in helping God's people traverse their life journey and grow in their relationship with God. We should remember that the Psalms are prayers and as such are invaluable not only for their theological insight, but also for the ways they can enrich and transform our individual and communal prayers. Praying the Psalms has helped many believers establish and maintain regular and fulfilling prayer lives. This week, we will continue to look at the Psalms, especially in the context of times when things are not going great for us. (music) 
Sunday, January 7, Fostering the Use of the Psalms in Prayer Read Psalm 105, verse 5, Colossians 3.16 and James 5.13. What is the place of the Psalms in the believer's worship experience? First of all, Psalm 105, verse 5, Remember his marvellous works which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And James chapter 5 verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. A simple way of introducing the Psalms into daily life is to devote time each day to the reading of a Psalm, beginning with Psalm 1 and following the order given in the Psalter. Another way to read the Psalms that correspond to your present situation, whatever it happens to be, there are Psalms of lament and Psalms of communal lament, the Thanksgiving Psalms, hymns, penitential Psalms, the wisdom Psalms, Seeking God's Wisdom and Guidance, Historical Psalms, Psalms Containing Anger and Rage, and Pilgrimage Psalms. Over the course of this quarter, we'll be looking at many of them and studying these psalms in the context in which they appear. How, then, are we to read the psalms? First, read the psalm engaging in simple reflection, and then pray. Ruminating over the psalm involves reflection on the various aspects of the psalm, the way the psalmist addresses God and the reasons for the prayer. Consider how your situation corresponds to the psalmist's experience and how the psalm might be able to help you articulate your experience. You will be amazed at how often you will find yourself being able to resonate and relate to what you read there. If something in the psalm challenges you, ponder, for example, whether the psalm corrects your present false hopes about something you are facing. Contemplate the psalm's message in the light of Christ's person and salvific work and the long-term hope Christ's work offers us. As we know, or should know, it always helps to look at everything in the Bible in light of Christ and the cross. Also, look for new motives for prayer that the psalm supplies and think about their importance for you, your church and the world. Ask God to put his word on your heart and mind. If the psalm corresponds to the situation of someone you know, intercede in prayer for that person. The point is, the psalms cover so many aspects of life, and we can be enriched by reading and absorbing into our hearts what they are saying to us. And so to finish today, what does it mean in Colossians 3.16 to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly? Why is reading the Bible the first and most crucial step for that experience? Monday, January 8, Trust in Times of Trouble All Christians know and have experienced times of despair and suffering, times when they have wondered what the Lord is doing or why the Lord is allowing these things to happen to them. The psalmists themselves went through similar things and, through divine inspiration, they recorded what they had experienced. Read Psalm 44. What is it saying to us, and why is this relevant to believers in all ages? In my Bible, it's titled, To the Chief Musician, A Contemplation of the Sons of Korah. Psalm 44, beginning at verse 1. We have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us, the deeds you did in their days, in days of old. You drove out the nations with your hand, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples and cast them out. 
For they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them. But it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance, because you favoured them. You are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Through you we will push down our enemies. Through your name we will trample those who rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me. But you have saved us from our enemies, and have put to shame those who hated us. In God we boast all day long, and praise your name forever. Selah. But you have cast us off and put us to shame, and you do not go out with our armies. You make us turn back from the enemy, and those who hate us have taken spoil for themselves. You have given us up like sheep intended for food, and have scattered us among the nations. You sell your people for next to nothing, and are not enriched by selling them. You make us a reproach to our neighbours, a scorn and a derision to those all around us. You make us a byword among the nations, a shaking of the head among the peoples. My dishonour is continually before me, and the shame of my face has covered me, because of the voice of him who reproaches and reviles because of the enemy and the avenger. All this has come upon us, but we have not forgotten you, nor have we dealt falsely with your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way, but you have severely broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we had forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to a foreign God, would not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Yet for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Awake! Why do you sleep, O Lord? Arise! Do not cast us off forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust, our body clings to the ground. Arise for our help and redeem us for your mercy's sake. The selectiveness of psalms in church worship services often reflects the exclusiveness of moods and words that we express in our communal prayers. Such restrictiveness may be a sign of our inability or uneasiness to engage the dark realities of life. Though we may sometimes feel that God treats us unfairly when suffering hits us, we do not find it appropriate to express our thoughts in public worship or even in private prayer. This reluctance could cause us to miss the point of worship. The failure to express honestly and openly our feelings and views before God in prayer often leaves us in bondage to our own emotions. This also denies us confidence and trust in approaching God. Praying the Psalms gives an assurance that when we pray and worship, we are not expected to censure or deny our experience. Psalm 44, which we've just read, for example, can help worshippers articulate their experience of innocent suffering freely and adequately. Praying the Psalms helps people experience freedom of speech in prayer. The Psalms give us words that we can neither find nor dare to speak. As in verse 18 and 19 of Psalm 44, our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way, but you have severely broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. Notice, however, how Psalm 44 begins. The writer is talking about how, in the past, God had done great things for his people. Hence, the author expresses his trust in God and not in my bow in verse 6. Despite this, trouble has still come to God's people. The list of woe and lament is long and painful. However, even amid all this, the psalmist cries out for God to deliver, to redeem us for your mercy's sake, it said in verse 26. That is, even amid the trouble, he knows the reality of God and his love. And so to finish the day, how can drawing on past times 
when God's presence felt very real, help you deal with the times in which troubles make you think that God is far away? Tuesday, January 9, a psalm of despair. Praying the psalms does more than enable worshippers to articulate their prayers freely. The psalms supervise their experience according to God's standards and make it bearable by introducing hope and reassurance of God's presence. Read Psalm 22. What can we learn from this psalm about trust in God amid great suffering? Psalm 22, beginning at verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? O my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear, and in the night season, and am not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you, and were delivered. They trusted in you, and were not ashamed. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet." I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard, My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust shall bow before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive." A posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, that he has done this. The lamenting words of Psalm 22, 1, may help suffering people express their grief and sense of loneliness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? 
These words, of course, have become famous among Christians because they were the same words that Jesus himself, while on the cross, uttered, showing us how central to Christ's experience the Psalms were, as we read in Matthew 27 and verse 46, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? However, even amid the suffering and trials, these words also are expressed. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you, in Psalm 22, verse 22. In other words, though these exact feelings may not coincide with the author's present dilemma, the psalmist was still expressing his faith in God and declaring that, no matter what, he would still praise God. The point is, by giving us words to pray, the Psalms teach us to look beyond our current situation and by faith to see the time when our life will be restored by God's grace. Praying the Psalms thus takes worshippers to new spiritual horizons. The Psalms let worshippers express their feelings and understandings, but they are not left where they presently are. The worshippers are led to abandon their burdens of pain, disappointment, anger and despair before God and to trust in Him, whatever their circumstances. The movement from lament to praise observed in many psalms is suggestive of the spiritual transformation that the believers experience when they receive divine grace and comfort in prayer. And so to finish the day... How can we learn to see beyond our immediate trials and thus trust in God's goodness, whatever we face now? Wednesday, January 10, From Despair to Hope We all have probably faced times when the presence of God seemed very far from us. Who at times has not thought, how could this have happened? The psalmists, humans like the rest of us, surely face similar things. Though, yes, at times our sins bring trials upon us, at other times they seem to be so unfair, and we feel as if we did not deserve what we are now faced with. Again, who has not been there? Read Psalm 13. What two main moods can you distinguish in this psalm? What decision do you think brought the radical change in the psalmist's general outlook? It's titled in my Bible, To the Chief Musician, A Psalm of David, Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God, enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemy say, I have prevailed against him, lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. What decision do you think brought the radical change in the psalmist's general outlook? How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me, is verse 1. Again, who cannot relate to these sentiments as wrong as they might be? Does God ever forget any of us? Psalm 13, then, points to the way to avoid another common mistake, focusing on ourselves and our problems when praying. This psalm can transform our prayer by leading us to reaffirm the faithful and unchanging nature of God's dealings with his people. Sure, though the psalm does begin with laments and complaints, it does not end there. And that's the crucial point. 
The psalm leads us to deliberately choose to trust God's redemptive power in verse 5. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. So that our fear and anxiety, as expressed in verses 1 to 4, can gradually give way to God's salvation. And we begin experiencing change from lament to praise, from despair to to hope, as we read in verses 5 and 6, But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully with me. However, a mere repetition of the words of the Psalms, with only a slight comprehension of their meaning, will not produce the authentic transformation intended by their use. When praying the Psalms, we should seek the Holy Spirit to enable us to act in the way demanded by the Psalm. The Psalms are the Word of God by which believers' characters and actions are transformed, not simply informed. By God's grace, the promises of the Psalms are made manifest in the lives of believers. This means that we allow God's word to shape us according to God's will and to unite us with Christ who demonstrated God's will perfectly and, as the incarnate Son of God, prayed the Psalms as well. And so to finish today, how can your trials draw you closer to God? Why, if you're not careful, can they push you away from Him? Thursday, January 11, O Restore Us Again. Read Psalm 60, verses 1 to 5. For what occasions do you think this psalm would be a suitable prayer? How can we benefit from the psalms of lament, even in joyous seasons of life? In my Bible, this psalm is titled, a Mitchum of David for teaching, when he fought against Mesopotamia and Syria of Zorba, and Joab returned and killed 12,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. Psalm 60, beginning at verse 1. O God, you have cast us off, you have broken us down, you have been displeased. O restore us again. You have made the earth tremble, you have broken it. Heal its breaches, for it is shaking. You have shown your people hard things. You have made us drink the wine of confusion. You have given a banner to those who fear you, that it may be displayed because of the truth. Salah that your beloved may be delivered. Save with your right hand and hear me. Psalms of lament are generally understood as prayers of people living through trying times, whether physical, psychological or spiritual, or all three. However, this does not mean that we should avoid these psalms even in good times. Sometimes there may be a total disjunction between the words of the psalm and the worshipper's present experience. That is, psalms of lament can be beneficial to worshippers who are not in distress. First, they can make us more aware that suffering is part of the general human experience and that it happens to both the righteous and the wicked. The Psalms assure us that God is in control and provides strength and solutions in times of trouble. Even in this psalm, even amid the trouble, you have made the earth tremble, in verse 2, the psalmist displays his ultimate hope in God's deliverance. Second, the lament psalms teach us compassion toward the sufferers. When expressing our happiness and gratitude to God, especially in public, we must be mindful of the less fortunate. Sure, we might have things good right now, but who doesn't know of people all around us who are suffering terribly? Praying such psalms can help us not forget those who are going through tough times. The Psalms should evoke in us compassion and a desire to minister to the suffering as Jesus did. 
This world is a vast laser house, Ellen White writes in Welfare Ministry, pages 24 and 25. But Christ came to heal the sick, to proclaim deliverance to the captives of Satan. He was in himself health and strength. He imparted his life to the sick, the afflicted, those possessed of demons. He turned away none who came to receive his healing power. He knew that those who petitioned him for help had brought disease upon themselves, yet he did not refuse to heal them. And when virtue from Christ entered into these poor souls, they were convicted of sin and many were healed of their spiritual disease as well as of their physical maladies. The Gospels still possesses the same power. And why should we not today witness the same results? End of quote. And so to finish the day, whom do you know right now who needs not only your prayers but your ministering touch as well. Friday, January 12. Ellen G. White describes David's penitent psalms, for instance, Psalm 51, as the language of his soul and prayers that illustrate the nature of true sorrow for sin. And you can read about that in Steps to Christ, pages 24 and 25. She encourages believers to memorize texts from the Psalms as the means of fostering the sense of God's presence in their lives and highlights Jesus' practice of lifting his voice with Psalms when met with temptation and oppressive fear. She also remarks in Education, page 162 to 168, How often, by words of holy song, are unsealed in the soul the springs of penitence and faith, of hope, and love, and joy. Indeed, many a song is prayer. End of quote. When we pray and sing the Psalms, we assume the persistence, boldness, courage, and hope of the psalmists. They encourage us to continue our spiritual journey and comfort us that we are not alone. Other people like us have gone through dark times and yet were triumphant by the grace of God. At the same time, the Psalms reveal to us the glimpses of Christ's fervent intercession on our behalf, as he always lives to pray for us, as it says in Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Engaging psalms in prayer and worship makes the believing community aware of the full range of human experience and teaches the worshippers to engage in the various facets of that experience in worship. The psalms are divine human prayers and songs. For that reason, including psalms consistently in worship brings the believing community to the centre of God's will and powerful healing grace. And that brings us to our discussion questions for this week. 1. Why is spontaneous unguided prayer not the only way to pray? How can our prayer life benefit from the psalms, the biblical prayers? 2. How can the Psalms enrich our communal prayer experience? Discuss some practical ways your local church can foster the use of the Psalms in its worship services. And three, what do the Psalms reveal about the complexity of the human pilgrimage of faith and the power of God's healing grace? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Cry of Red Austin's Heart by Andrew McChesney Red Austin disliked his life. His friends did not exert a good influence over him. He dabbled in illegal drugs and petty crime. The constant cry of his heart was, I want to change, I want to change, I want to change. Growing older, Red Austin got married and had two sons. Times were tough, and he left his homeland of Bulgaria in search of work. As he worked in Western Europe, he made new friends. He longed for truth. He wished that his new friends would reveal the truth to him. 
Now the constant cry of his heart was, How can people who know the real truth find me? After some time, he moved again in search of a better job. But in six weeks, he hit rock bottom. He found himself living in a small rented room with no money and no food. He was very, very hungry. In desperation, his heart cried out to God one night. God, help me, he said, praying for the first time in his life. Send me someone. In the morning, someone knocked on his door. It was a man in a suit. In his hand was a Bible. Radiston understood that God had sent the man in answer to his prayer. The man, Paul, brought food for Radiston to eat. He invited him to church. Radiston went and was surprised. He had never been to a house of worship where he sensed God's love. His heart was touched and he wept. Returning to Bulgaria, he told his family repeatedly about meeting God and experiencing his love at Paul's church. He longed to return to the church, but he wasn't sure that his wife would agree to even move. Like himself, she had been raised in another world religion. He prayed, God, if it is your will, if you are God, help. If Paul's church is your true church, send my family and me there. I want to have a complete change in my life. One day, Radiston's wife abruptly announced, I don't want to live in Bulgaria. I want to live in the city of Paul's church. With those words, Radiston realised that it was God's will for his family to move. He also realised that his wife wanted to know God. The family moved. Today, Radiston is an active member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and goes to Paul's church every Sabbath. Times still can be tough, but he is no longer worried. We don't pray for God to give us everything, but we pray that he will protect us from evil, he told Adventist Mission. We ask that he helps us to live through trials. He has no doubt that God hears his prayers. I was not a good person as a young man, he said, but praise God, he really has changed my heart. Thank you for your support of Adventist Mission, whose global mission centres help people better understand how to share the good news of salvation with precious people from other world religions.